the human life, according to the spe uh, present expectancy tables, can be roughly divided into three parts. The first 25 years being considered youth and uh, now largely devoted to growing up and attaining an education. The second 25 year span we like to think of as maturity. Maturity in the sense that it presents the period of maximum physical resources and is associated with the problem of social adjustment. From the 50th year on, we come up to what might be termed advancing years. Years in which, inevitably, our attitudes on subjects of living pass through modifications. Actually, therefore, the human being with a 75-year life expectancy lives three lives in this course of time. These lives can almost be considered separate existences. For while actually they are not accompanied by any startling transformations of appearance, they are accompanied by very startling transformations of attitudes. The individual changes is psychic polarization. This is perhaps a rather gradual procedure, may take several years, but it does inevitably come. And with it there are transformations taking place within us which have always occurred at these periods in the lives of human beings, which every generation has had to face, and which really constitute what we might term the basis of the generation concept, that generations follow each other according to certain natural time and age sequences. The first period that we are concerned with, we may say, is youth. This extends actually from birth to the achievement of maturity. Maturity itself is a very abstract kind of word. Perhaps we can best associate it with the concept that in any generation, maturity is adjustment with the mature life of that generation. Maturity does not necessarily mean that we have grown up it means that we have leveled off according to the dominant psychological code of our day. We say that a large part of youth is adjustment. And this is essentially the basis of our psychological problem involving young people. They are trying to find out how to live. And from the earliest time, nature told them, through example, that the way to find out how to live was to watch the mature unit of their society and follow its leadership. Uh, rabbits instinctively learn the secret of survival simply by watching their parents. The same is true of practically every wild animal and bird. There is no verbal communication, but from the reactions of the parent, the young gains a certain instruction. When the parent crouches down to remain invisible against some danger, the young follows and does the same thing. To fail in this is to die. And survival means to obey 
the example of the mature. There is no question that this is also the natural instinct of the human being. Growing up, he has to turn somewhere for guidance. He has to contemplate with his own inadequate and immature faculties the problem of his own survival. How is he going to grow up? How is he going to achieve his ultimate maturity? What can he do? What should he do? What must he not do? These are things that every young person wants to know. The great difficulty we have had in recent years is the confusion and disorientation of the so-called mature generation. Parents are not able to guide their own lives. They are not able to make their own decisions thoughtfully and wisely. They are unable to cope with the situations that arise in their own living. And therefore, they cannot set the examples and establish the patterns for their own young. Many parents, most parents, would like to. I think it is a mistake to assume that the average parent does not care. They do care. But they are just as bewildered as their children. And they lack one quality that the child possesses and that is abundant energy. Therefore, in history and in psychology, we know that rebellion arises most rapidly in the young. First, because energy is more abundant, and secondly, because reason has not dulled the edge of action. The young person has not had enough experience to become afraid become disillusioned, or accept the inevitability of futility. So what do we have as the problem of the young person today? We have a generation growing up essentially without leadership. I've had a good many younger people come to me, and while many of them, in a sense, enjoy lack of direction, they rather like the freedom of doing as they please. Very few of them believe in it as a philosophy of life. Most of them realize that something wrong is happening, but they do not know what it is. They are convinced that the world is not moving toward a practical achievement that those who are creating and building our way of life know what they are creating or what they are building. And this insecurity must inevitably result in a great deal of nervous tension. If we could only give young people a reasonable measure of leadership, I believe they would accept it even now. But this leadership is not available. How are parents going to give leadership to their children when the parents themselves are going to psychologists and psychiatrists to try to put their own lives in order? Today, the mature generation that should set the example is in just as grave difficulties as the younger generation. Not knowing what to do with these young people, their confused elders are turning in every direction to frame for these young people the support that is necessary for them. But the elders are turning to solutions they would not consider for themselves. They do not realize that false answers 
or solutions that do not solve cannot long hold the attention of the young. In the failure of the mature generation to meet its own responsibilities, it has also failed to support in society any structure that would be protective of young people. So today the parents turn to the churches for the instruction of their young. But most of them do not go to church themselves. Or if they do, have gained very little from it. And yet they expect the children to gain much. Another opportunity is education. Give the child education. Give it the opportunity to learn more, to build a better career. Yet many of the parents that are mentally confused and emotionally sick themselves are educated. Today we have more and more persons of brilliant minds falling apart. We used to feel that the educated person had tremendous securities and resources. Well, probably he did under the conditions of a different generation. But today, your educated person is the most confused and uncertain of all. Some of the worst doctrines being circulated in, this, in human society today are being taught by college professors. The educated person experiences the strangest and most complicated futility of all. His education does not permit him to follow the old ways nor does it provide him with a mental nature strong enough to make new ways that are important. So the educated person is, is in the position to suffer acutely. He has gained a sufficient skill to think, but not enough skill to think well. The young person graduating from the present educational facilities therefore is not assured of emotional maturity or intellectual integration. He is very fortunate if he graduates with as much integrity as he possessed when he was enrolled. He is fortunate if his educational structure does not contribute to his demoralization. So here we have the tension problems of youth. We have young people completely leaderless at a period of life in which they cannot lead themselves adequately. We find them, therefore, becoming emotionally uh, unstable. We find a, an hysteria taking over a large part of their conduct they are trying to escape into something or from something, taking the attitude that a tremendous immediate activity is the only solution to their problem, to forget themselves in some kind of a mood as strange and unhealthy as that of a Central African witch doctor. There is no integration here. No clear vision of value. This is true in the leadership of young nations coming up. The young nation has no mature nations to lead it or guide it. There is only a wide diversity of immaturities. Nothing is real, nothing is sensible, nothing is factual. In the presence of this confusion, we do have a great deal of willfulness. Willfulness which simply is a rebellion, not against parents, but against certain attitudes, certain basic patterns which arise in the parental environment. I think that many 
children, young people in their late teens or middle teens could accomplish something for themselves if they would simply turn back on their parents and say, lead, give us some strength, tell us what we should be doing, and make us do it. But the parent falls apart and will go under sedation if such a suggestion was made. They do not know what to do, what to say, how to lead. They do not even know what their children should believe because they do not know what to believe themselves. Their own generation was without adequate integration. Now this condition goes along and we have all kinds of strange and eccentric outbreaks. We have youth getting into difficulty more than we like. But gradually, this first great change begins to take place within the structure of youth itself. Young people are not primarily changed by the world. They are changed by psychophysical processes occurring within themselves. Little by little, the shadow of maturity begins to be noted on the faces of the young. Things are changing. Interests are changing. And there comes a time when young people are very keenly aware of it today, when the young set crosses out the old person of plenty. There has come this point where there is a sharp line of demarcation. The moment the individual begins to move into the maturity patterns, things begin to happen inside of his own economy. His interests change, and the great patterns of society which have control for ages begin to move in on him. He is no longer without some kind of leadership. Two or three executive forces begin to operate in his life. He comes under the one leadership, perhaps, that is still left to us. And it will be a bad day if we lose it. And that is the leadership of work. Somewhere along the way, it becomes apparent to the young person that he must make a life for himself. In this, he finds plenty of example around him. He knows that most other young people must find jobs, must create careers for themselves, must gain certain skills and proficiencies, and most of all, that in order to keep the job or to grow in the business, you have to begin to obey rules. So maturity is the end of this enchanting process of doing as you please. With it comes the inevitable pressures of necessity. In the early years of maturity, it is most probable that young people will marry. And when they have really assumed the responsibilities of family, uh, they begin to experience new values. Uh, new challenging forces arising in themselves, perhaps consummated by family, by the advent of children. Though, of course, if the young person has had no background in self-discipline, has never really seen in his own childhood family any closeness between his parents, has never had the observation of seeing sacrifice gallantly given to preserve a family integrity. And there is nothing in his own experience about the strength of family 
the young family builder will be at a very serious disadvantage. Against this disadvantage, however, is the social factor. He feels that he has to succeed, because without such success he loses status. If he fails in a family, it cannot be completely concealed, and while failure is not taken as seriously as it used to be, it is held still as a defeat as far as the ego is concerned. So the problem of the job, the problem of the additional economic strain of maturity begins to creep in on the individual. This forces him to take his mind off of himself to some degree. If he is unable to make this transition, then he is a perpetual adolescent. But if he makes some kind of a fair adjustment, he begins to realize that life is serious business, and that it has to be lived according to certain rules. Once having accepted this inevitable, the person begins to experience the maturing of his inner life. He begins to think in terms of those who depend upon him. He cannot entirely avoid uh, the obligations of property owning, of various investments, and the gradual building of an economic reserve. He is faced with the prospect of educating his own children. And these problems immediately divide the men from the boys. Today, a great many young people, both men and women, fall apart under the pressure of the responsibilities of maturity. We find a large group of neurotics who simply cannot stand the thought of the curtailment of their own freedoms. I had a man in not long ago who was gradually recovering from a fifth marriage. He walked out on every family situation the moment it interfered with his own liberties. He could not stand the thought of a dollar that he earned being spent by anything or anyone but himself. Obviously, he was a joy to live with. <laughs> and his own life had brought, had brought this condition. His own parents had begrudged him every nickel they ever spent on him. He had no background of securities and no resources in himself. Now, when a person fails in a perfectly natural and normal responsibility, the psychic hurt is, is perhaps deeper than we like to realize. We cannot expect everyone to be magnificently heroic. But to have no heroism in one's nature is not very helpful or very acceptable, even to the person himself. He almost inevitably comes to the conclusion that he's a pretty weak person that he's not much good, that when it comes to a decision he never is able to make it, and when it comes to responsibility he is forever attempting to avoid it. To try to live with yourself when you know those kind of things about yourself is not easy. So we have all kinds of escapists trying to run away from the fact that they cannot live with their own reflection in their mental mirror. Here we find many different weaknesses take over, taking over the life of the person. However, if you try reasonably hard, you're also inclined in the course of this pattern to a number of blind alleys 
We will assume for a moment that the young person starting out to create a home is ambitious, is conscientious in his desire to provide a good living for his family, and has fair resources with which to achieve these ends. But now he is presiding over a menage of complicated beings. He has perhaps parents to think of, he has a wife to consider, perhaps her parents, and also their children. This is quite a responsibility <coughs> for a person who has never been really instructed in how to carry the responsibility with dignity. In the course of trying to balance this situation, the homemaker is today poorly equipped to discipline the home over which he presides. Thus the family itself gets out of hand almost immediately, and instead of becoming a strong pattern of support, becomes merely a continually increasing drain upon the family resources. Every member of the family wants everything. In a very short time, there is the talk of the larger house, then the swimming pool, then better cars, then a car for every child. And so it goes until the uh, producing unit is confronted with a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar investment in the college education of each child alone. This gradually produces a situation that is economically unsound. The individual today cannot meet such a demand without a series of temptations and pressures which are very difficult uh, to withstand. The constantly increasing demand for money may force the person uh, to take on more responsibilities than he is able to carry, may force him to do twilighting and other uh, ways of increasing income, or be in constant conflict with the family because he doesn't earn more. By degrees, the normal, dignified human relationship, which should have brought strength, the family which should have given tremendous encouragement and vital support to each of its members, finally settles down to living off of the other members, each one, a tri each one trying to get the lion's share of whatever there is. This becomes a pretty disillusioning process. And uh, in this period of life, we have a great deal of physical trouble at the present time. We have the ulcers and we have the heart attacks. We have the breakups and the crack-ups. We have the individuals unable to create a decent home environment because of pressures, and therefore their children growing up to add further pressure and heartbreak to their parents. The situation is viciously out of hand. But as it is at the moment, the average homeowner owner sees no solution. He cannot tighten his own authority without open revolution. He cannot demand better conditions because he is outnumbered by the entire family group. And each day more means and ways for spending money are being introduced into our way of life. With everything else, taxes rising, costs rising, demands rising, appetites increasing every moment, and we now accept as absolute necessities luxuries that our ancestors did not dream they could ever hope to possess. So by the time the individual reaches 50, the end of his second little cycle, he is pretty well tired out. <clears throat> Within his own nature, there is gradually rising a revulsion. When he was a child, he didn't know what he was. 
When he was an adult, he never had an opportunity to find out what he was. And as he passes into the third part of life, he comes face to face with the fact that he himself is the person he does not know, that he has never had any chance to know, but locked within himself are many values which he would like to develop, but has had no opportunity to develop them. Although this condition begins to show itself in the fifties of life, our economic society plays the same trick on this man that it plays upon the young. Young people are biologically mature at 14 to 16 years, but they're not economically mature until 25. The individual in the latter part of life begins to advance into what might be termed the cycle of self-analysis or the cycle of contemplation in his fifties, but he does not retire from business until he is sixty-five. Therefore, a great part of the latter years of his business life are years of conflict. There is no relationship between his psychological age and his economic age. As a result of trying to stretch his money-making propensities beyond their normal span in his psychic integration, the individual at 65 retires under most unfavorable psychological pressures. Instead of being able to retire with a reasonable amount of constructive energy available to him, he is likely to retire pretty well tired out. He has had to continue to follow courses of action that are less and less interesting to him. He is required to continue uh, ways of economic survival, which he realizes within himself will lead nowhere. By the time the person comes very close to his 60th year, he realizes that the great incentive for accumulation is gone, that the great pressure for a career is gone. Now there are persons, of course, who will never release themselves from pressures, but where an individual in advancing years is still desperately concerned with the affairs of middle life, he is psychologically abnormal. He is not doing the things that are best for him. He is not using life as it was intended that he should use it. But as our way of life is as it is, we know now that arbitrarily the individual must wait retirement age unless he is one of a small group that can afford to retire when he pleases. Having come finally to this retirement age, the person looks back over his life, for at this time he is supposed to begin to gain from experience. He is supposed to be able to look back upon a life reasonably well lived. He is supposed to have fairly comfortable memories. It is assumed that he was a good son, a good husband, a good father, that he did these various jobs uh, as conscientiously as possible, that he carried his life along with dignity on a reasonable pattern of consistencies. It is also assumed that he will carry no great grudges against society, but because his moderate interests were within bounds, he was able to fulfill them to a satisfactory degree. Under these conditions, the person should, as he reaches his elder years, 
have a certain consolation in his own character. He has lived his life as well as he could. He is not too ashamed of it, though perhaps not inordinately proud. He also has theoretically learned from life. He has finally found in the experiences of living the ultimate justification of his philosophy of life and his religion. He should be able, looking back over fifty or sixty years of living, he should be able to know from this living itself that his faith was real, that the laws and covenants of his religion were true, that they sustained him, that he kept them and they kept him, that the various principles that he was taught were the right principles, and wherever he followed them and obeyed them, he flourished. Where he disobeyed them, he was penalized. Thus, out of the years of life, he should have the proof of what constitutes a proper way of life. Today, the individual looking back over his life does not see too much clearly in the form of these directives. He reaches retirement age without any particular faith in society. He does not believe that society was based upon any ethical pattern, nor does he believe that ethics necessarily contributed very much to his happiness and security. He experienced more a life of intense competition and recognized society merely as a tremendous collective force which bestowed upon him little more than exhaustion. So he finally retires. He retires with the full realization in himself most people have this, that the essential situation now is twofold. First, to lighten the load. The person who wanted to accumulate in his younger years suddenly loses the desire to accumulate. If he doesn't lose it at this time, it's a bad sign. He begins to wish to be free from the responsibility of unnecessary possessions. He does not want to own things that he cannot use. He wants a few things that he cherishes and which are companionable to him. But he wants to simplify life so that no longer his energy is exhausted in the protection or possession of things which contribute very little to his peace of mind. So he wants to gradually lift from himself all unnecessary fatiguing responsibilities. The second thing that he distinctly wants at this time is a, as a sense within himself, a growing sense of his own eternity. The older person must either increase his faith in the substance of things unseen, or else life becomes pretty difficult. He must also undoubtedly adjust more and more to the limitations of his own health and his own energies. For as one English philosopher observed, Age comes to every man as a surprise. He doesn't realize it until it hits him. Under these conditions, his philosophy of life is called upon very strongly. In this transition, bewilderment can also take over. And with this bewilderment, a strong antisocial tendency. We have always at this time also the danger of the Faustian complex. That is, the danger of the individual becoming desperate because he has not lived in any mature sense of the word and feels life slipping away from him. 
<coughs> this individual tries to recapture youth and embraces death instead. So a great deal depends upon integrating the pattern of life in this older period of living. The end that is desirable and which is theoretically attainable and which sometime I think we will realize more and more can be attained is that life itself should be under such control, direction, and discipline that the individual ages completely rather than only in certain areas of his nature. By this I mean particularly that theoretically most diseases that affect the old are diseases which arise from wrong attitudes, wrong reactions and relations with life, and perhaps strong character defects. These have a tendency to become more acute, more chronic, more desperate as time goes on. And the lack of integration of our psychic nature is responsible for much of the misery of advancing years. Theoretically, if we were able to relax inwardly, we could maintain a quiet, constructive peace with ourselves and our world. There is no reason why, when the time comes, we should not simply sleep our way out of this world in peace. It is because of the confusion, chaos, and inconsistencies in our own nature that we are unable to make so dignified a transition. But it is conceivable that we can have the same experience that Plato had who at the end of 81 years went to sleep with the books of the point Sofran under his head and just did not awake the next morning. He was a life lived in peace with life, a life of integrity, a life of value, a life of quiet internal acceptances, a life guided by wisdom, a life expressing itself through benevolence, through charity, and through patience and quietude. It would be quite possible and conceivable that as man matures his inner consciousness, such a life and such a completion of life is within his grasp. But it is not possible uh, to say it can be achieved at the moment, but that all efforts in that direction may very well ultimately produce good in the life of each person, the best chance we have for a happy old age is to start the moment that we become aware of the need to bring our own temperament onto an even keel. For it is this unevenness that threatens the development and survival of our age patterns. So we have these three divisions of life. And now we want to try to think a little bit about Zen and what Zen means in these three stages of existence. If Zen stands for one thing more than another, it stands for tranquility. Now we cannot ask, probably, all young people to take up a study of this kind. There is no particular, particular reason why they could not. There is no reason why tranquility should not be as stylish as frenzy, but up to the present time it has not achieved this dignification. But one thing is certain, something resembling Zen or resembling a directive for personal integration should be incorporated into education. It should certainly be present in the higher, the two higher years of high school, and it should continue on into the university education. 
on the assumption that the more education the individual receives, the more important his inner tranquility becomes. <coughs> Perhaps a couple of years of it would be enough for the average person. But for the scholar, the scientist, the physician, the lawyer, the engineer, the technician, the demands upon his mind are such that his need for tranquility increases with his intellectual growth. This inclusion of a quiet pattern of self-discipline could very well be interesting to many young people. I have observed that a great number of those in their late teens and early twenties are interested in trying to find out something that will constitute a strong, clear, reasonable directive. Many of these young persons will not accept theology as it is now disseminated. They do not really want to be atheists. What they want is a working plan that works. And nearly every human being has a natural desire to respect something. And where he has no outlet where nothing seems to be worthy of respect, he is injured within his own nature. So I think we can say very definitely that by the time young people graduate from school and begin to establish homes, that many of them would recognize the value of some simple pattern of integration some rule for growing up in a quiet, orderly way. If such a rule was generally accepted, generally included, and generally admired, there would be no major problem in seeing it brought into effectiveness. It is only when it is an isolated circumstance that the believer is at such disadvantage. Today in the world, particularly and mostly in Asia, there are somewhat more than five million Zen. Uh, these people constitute a considerable block, although, of course, a very small minority of mankind. But they do represent persons in many walks of life and many different uh, basic convictions. They're not all exactly alike, although they share in this primary belief. In addition to those who are actually Zen, we should realize that this doctrine is derived largely from China and India and belongs to the meditation systems of India. Following through all of the uh, ramifications of the meditation system, I think we can say that in all probabilities, the number of those who are depending upon the uh, integration of their inner resources as a protection against outer circumstances, that this number will probably run to two or three hundred million. It constitutes all in all the faith of Asia, as contrary largely to the faith of Western man. The faith of Asia is rooted in the discovery of the indestructible self. That this self is not dependent upon society. That this self is a leader and not a follower. But that the leadership of the self is never a leadership into radicalism. It is not an anti-social leadership. It is not a leadership against others. Rather, it is a leadership against weakness, whether it be in self or in others. It is the resolute determination not to be swept away by the common errors of the time, but to build a life upon such principles as are inwardly experienced to be true. Then, because it is a doctrine of experience, is available to young people 
in a very interesting way. What are the experiences of young people inside themselves? How many times have they wept themselves to sleep because of the lack of affection in their homes? How many are broken-hearted over the feuds between their own parents? How many have seen those that they are supposed to love and respect perform actions that no normal person could love or respect? How much disillusionment has arisen in the lives of these young people, especially now? Today, by the time a young person reaches 18 or 20, he is perfectly capable of the Zen experience. He is capable of beginning to put in order the injustice, the confusion, the inconsistencies which have enveloped him throughout his childhood. He is also in a position to estimate very clearly the weaknesses of his educational system. He is perfectly able to pick out a degenerate professor from an honest one. He knows whether or not he is being well taught and whether he has a right to respect his teacher. These things he knows within himself. But not knowing what to do about what he knows, he finally gives up, goes along with the crowd and uses any means that he can to forget his own misgivings. But these misgivings are his then opportunity. And if there were means afforded to him to realize the importance of gradually, maturely digesting the experiences that once frightened him, the recognition of the real facts behind uh, situations that have offended and angered him. Gradually, our young person could use his own disillusionments as a strong force in the discovery of truth within himself. One thing that Western man must yet do, and that is to recognize that the source of truth is internal. But while facts may be gathered from the outside, the transmutation of fact into living value must be from within the self. A philosophy, therefore, which causes the person to develop reliance in self, build upon the integrity of self, and learn to depend upon self only in the great emergencies of life, such a person cannot be disillusioned, cannot be uh, betrayed by any of the exterior circumstances uh, which so terrify those lacking inner foundations. So the young person is perhaps nearer to the Zen than he will be at any other time in life. He has not yet had a time or an opportunity to build so many excuses and defenses that life can never be faced honestly again. He is not caught in a machinery against which he cannot rebel. He has not been locked within a financial structure which he must obey or perish. He is still a relatively free agent. And in that free agency, he has the right to take hold of and come into control of his own life. If in this transition period, before between 18 and 25, the young person was able to establish internal resource, this would accomplish many, many things. First, it would remove forever uh, the condemnation which many hold to their own elders. It would give the individual the insight to know why his parents failed him, and would help him to realize that unless he takes hold of the situation with greater wisdom and strength than they did, he in turn will fail his own children. 
he then begins to recognize that there is only one solution, and that solution is the taking hold upon reality. To achieve this, he must have, at, at all best, only a hint of the value. If he becomes aware of the fact, he must do the rest himself. There is no possible way in which uh, this process can be systematized into an infallible doctrine or dogma. All that can be communicated is the need. <coughs> All that the young person can do is to become aware of the meditation system of Zen, realizing that this system, as far as its outer form is concerned, can be communicated in a few hours but as an inner experience may require an entire life, maybe more than one life. But it is a dedication to the strengthening of value inside. Once having established value, the individual has a rule of judgment, then bestows maturity of judgment. It frees the individual from his intensities, but in no way frees him from his responsibilities. Zen is based upon two concepts, true wisdom and true love. To discover what wisdom means is to discover one of the great keys for existence. To discover what love really means is to become empowered with perhaps the noblest concept that man can experience or possess. Then having set the person in a very quiet way in the realization that he has the right, the inalienable right, to be right, that no one can take this right away from him unless he voluntarily surrenders it. And anyone who voluntarily surrenders it betrays himself and the person to whom he makes the surrender. There can be no solution through the loss of value. But once Zen is established, it is almost inconceivable that it can be surrendered. The experienced fact cannot be denied, and it would require the complete loss of reason, a terrible sickness of the mind to deprive the reasonable person of his code of life. How having set these matters into some kind of a pattern, the individual is then able to move into the second period of life and achieve his own maturity. Even if he does not become aware of some of the problems until he reaches maturity, he still has time. But under the concept of meditation, leadership from within the self, there is much greater and more reasonable probability of the establishment of a good home. Sense of strength. If both persons have the same conviction, the problem of the home is practically solved, because both will then support the home itself, the entity, which can only exist because it is reasonably and intelligently maintained by the inner strength of all the members. Under such conditions also, children will be taught from birth, practically, the importance of inner strength. They will be taught the basic principles of relationship, not by word alone, but by example. They will learn from the conduct of their parents why this conduct is better than the conduct of their neighbor's parents. They will realize little by little what integrity means. And most of all, these children will never experience confusion, as this generation has experienced it. From the beginning, they will be capable of silence. 
They will be capable of quietude. They will find peace with themselves. This type of thing going on into every phase of life moderates ambitions, clarifies responsibilities, and gives the person in his work the inner tranquility against the pressures of those who have no inner resources. With quietude inside, we can carry a prodigious amount of work with practically no damage. With quietude inside, we can adjust to the whims and problems of the times. We are not injured, we are not destroyed. We understand, we realize, we recognize, and in ever tension or stress arises, we seek to experience the truth of it. And the truth of all stress is quietude. So we get beyond these surfaces, and we find that our health and our state of mind and gradually our social position, all are improved. Then as we go along into the closing years of life, we are liberated from the strange negation that so often creeps over the elderly. We are no longer concerned about either past or future for that matter. Meditation reveals to us quietly the eternity of existence, the eternity of life. The individual who has gone inside of himself has left this world and come back a member of back. He has left this world whenever he sought the consolation of consciousness and insight. He finds, even while he lives here, that the world is not necessary to him that it is an interlude, that it is something from which he learns, but that of itself it is not his, nor is he bound to it by any rule or power other than his own voluntary acceptance of worldliness. As he proceeds further along, he also discovers what most of the Zen have discovered, the importance of the long, quiet evening of tranquility. It is after the, be after the uh, beginning, we might say, of this third part of life that the great artist in man reveals its genius. Here the person who has been thoughtful, who has experienced and understood, suddenly finds himself the possessor of a tremendous, artistry. He begins to recognize the incredible resource within himself. He finds that he is richer than he ever dreamed he could be, and that every part of his life is filled with worthwhileness in all of its aspects and conditions. He also then realizes that age <laughs> is reward, not punishment that in the long, quiet evening he can have the great joy of fulfillment. This last uh, spring, summer, when I was in Kyoto, I went out to one of the Zenji temples there. The little temple in the hills, it was pouring rain, and uh, uh, it was a hard place to find, not much visited by strangers but it had a little garden about half the size of this auditorium. This little garden was a place of extraordinary quietude, of great peace, and alongside of the garden on one edge was a veranda. It was what is called a viewing garden. You didn't walk around in it. You sat down in some convenient place under the veranda, and you just looked at it. And even in the rain, there were several interesting persons in that garden when I got there. There was an elderly man who was obviously a lay monk. That is, he was simply a Japanese gentleman who, having achieved around his 65th year, had voluntarily become a lay brother. He did not take the full obligations of a monk, but he became one 
who liked to visit the temple, who put on part of the robes of the monk, but did not take all of the obligations. But he was a lay brother, as we call him. He was sitting quietly on a mat near one end of the veranda, his hands in his lap, just simply looking out over a beautiful little pool and watching the golden carp flashing in the raindrops. The surface of the pool was agitated by the rain, and the fish cut through it with most beautiful leaps and jumps. There was a little spring that fed the pool, and the water was dropping over the edge of it. It was all very quiet. The gentleman was not really in meditation. He was simply wrapped in rapture of the sea. A strange, deep, wonderful smile was on his face. He was just supremely happy. He was happy in the presence of beauty. He was sort of inhaling it. He was living upon it. Uh, he did probably, he did not eat very much at that time of life. He didn't sleep a great deal. He didn't need it. He wasn't working very hard. His family were taking care of him, as was the custom. But he needed nourishment. And his great joy was to come and sit and watch the fish in the pool. At the opposite end of the, the long veranda was a mother with two or three small children. She also came simply for garden viewing, and so did the children. The children were three or four or five years old, quite small. But they were very, very quiet. And they, too, in their own way, were absolutely entranced with the beauty of it. Suddenly a little break came in the clouds, and a ray of light struck through the rain, which was still falling, and spread itself on a little stone pagoda by the side of the pool. It was a beautiful scene, just for a second. And the little children almost cried out in their acceptance and adoration of this beauty. They almost reached out their chubby little hands to grasp the sunbeam that came. They were happy, simply in the observation of beauty. Between them, partway down the veranda, was a third person, a young woman in her middle twenties, with a sketch pad, a young Japanese woman who was making a drawing of the scene. I learned from the monk in the monastery there that she came almost every day to draw that. Uh, she was a self-taught artist, and because she was taught only by the quietude of the garden, she had already won several prizes. She took no lessons. She simply accepted the teaching of the pool and the lantern and the waterfall. And she was completely absorbed in making the beautiful little Sumi drawings of all the moods and shapes and forms of that little garden with its rocks and its moss and its trees and the shadows that they cast upon uh, ancient pathways. Here was a Zen garden. The, uh, the young, the middle-aged, and the old, all finding in it beauty, which was its common message. Because this Zen garden is life. And in every age of life, we should find our world beautiful. And if we don't find it beautiful, it is because we have deformed it. And to restore that beauty, we must understand it again in ourselves. And if we can understand it in ourselves, we can recapture this beauty at any moment. And in recapturing it, we also give a great example to others. In going into this little garden and seeing these people there, each absorbed in his own meditation, in his own way, the meditation of childhood, laughter, and happiness, the meditation of the young woman, capturing beauty with a brush, the meditation of the elderly lay monk, whose meditation was with quiet folded hands, simply drinking in eternity. These meditations were important to me also. I learned something from them. And from the contemplation of life, 
both those who participate and those who observe become better, become richer as an experience in themselves. And the little monk who kept the place told me that families came. And an interesting thing about both Zen and Buddhism in general is the way in which the family does appear. It will arrive with hampers and baskets for a picnic. And in the very holy grounds of the temple, perhaps even before the altar, you will hear the laughter of children. Their religion is laughter, not solemnity. And the old monk who is the guardian of the place beams from ear to ear. He is very happy, for he has discovered that people come to his temple to laugh, to be happy, to enjoy themselves, to reunite families, to bring together all the common pleasures of the time. This is very good, but it's because it is not solemnity, but freedom of inner joy that is really the keynote of the Zen ministry. So in each area, area of our life, this ministry becomes one <clears throat> a fulfillment, never a frustration. And if we can begin to think about it, we can't start earlier than we learn. We cannot begin earlier than now. But always we can begin the moment we realize what Zen tells us, that some way, somehow, we must live with ourselves forever, that there is no way of escaping this strange, confused thing we call ourselves. There's no way of getting over our grudges, no way of getting past our prejudices, except by meditation by quietly letting go of them, by discovering instead of this world of our personal antagonisms, the greater world of universal peace. Sometime we must all make this adjustment because we are going to get desperately tired of being unhappy, especially when we realize that happiness is no further away the little golden fish dancing in a pool. That this happiness is not something on the other side of life or on the other side of the universe. It is simply man accepting the tremendous evidence of the divine plan. It takes anywhere from two to four hundred years to create a Zen garden. Some are rocks alone. Some are rocks and sand. Very few have any flowers, because flowers fade. And the blossom that is here today is gone tomorrow. Uh, Zen uh, wishes to emphasize rather timelessness. So he takes the little trees and the plants that are truly perennial, and it makes out of them its gardens. And these gardens actually are merely meditation captured in a little square of ground where land is almost priceless. In this country, we would never have sacrificed that much land for a garden. It is impossible to estimate the number of little gardens in the heart of Tokyo, gardens that are six feet square, four feet square, two feet wide and six feet long, or a tiny little garden hidden under the wash tub for lack of any other place. These gardens have their tree and their lantern and their waterfall, and the going value of property in Tokyo today is $5,000 a square foot. And yet there is room for a garden. Why? Because a garden is not just simply a luxury. It is man restating his faith in life. The garden is the acceptance that that little green square is forever the open door to eternity. It has to be. 
It has to be because individuals cannot be locked away from reality. They cannot forget beauty or how easily it can be captured. And when it is captured, how universal it becomes. So each person in his own part of life, in his own section of life, must, I think, develop a certain amount of Zen insight. He needs it very much these days. He needs to have the tranquility of an unchanging reality through which he passes. He must realize that his youth and his maturity and his advancing years are essentially only moods, moods in the conditioning of his own nature. If he has been young and is old, he will be young again. Whatever time of life he passes through, he has passed this way before and will pass many times in the future. Life is a, is a great cycle of return of restatements, each, however, on a little different level of insight, each with a little more of consciousness, each with a little less of pain. And the individual builds this way. I think there is a great need in our Western life now. We are, we are reaching a terrible crisis in our discontent. We are gradually coming to a condition in which we must find peace or perish. I do not think that nature wants us to perish or has any intentions of letting us perish. I think that nature is going to gradually force upon us this maturing of ourselves. And the example of how it is done occurs in our own personal lives, from youth to maturity to the dignities of advancing years. These are processes of maturing. But they also are symbols of, an, of another dimension of maturity that we have to achieve through insight. If we will then start wherever we are with our quiet practice of Zen, I think it will help us. For one thing, we may have to start alone. It is quite possible that if we tried to bring all our friends and relatives into this attitude, we would have a great deal of opposition. But one wonderful thing about Zen is that it does not depend upon what other people do. It depends only upon what we are. And if we can become clear enough if we can become wise enough and quiet enough, we can meet without fear anything that anyone else can do. We are not any longer dependent upon other people. Our joys and sorrows are no longer in the names of those around us. We have restored these rights to ourselves. This is not a selfishness. We are not out to be happy at the expense of anyone else. But it is only fair to realize that happiness is a something that we can possess more of without anyone else actually being deprived of any of it. Some may not appreciate our happiness. They may resent it and be jealous of it. But actually we are taking nothing from anyone else when we add to our own inner consciousness. We are not less reliable servants. We are not less thoughtful parents or less kindly friends. All of the virtues that we normally possess are increased rather than diminished. The only thing that is taken away from it is the strange subjective instinct to hurt. We no longer desire to build upon the pain of other things. We no longer wish to add one tiny fragment to the sorrows or miseries of the world. 
We wish to digest, assimilate, and transform within ourselves everything that is negative, everything that is evil, so that in no way will we add to the suffering of anything, nor will we carry ill report against anything, nor add to the doubts that others may hold. Our purpose is always a quiet, strong strength, a strength that is based upon a true insight, an insight that has gone so deep that it has always found the good, which is at the root and core of everything that exists. So we can take our little Zen garden of the world and divide it likewise into its seasons and its climates. The little Zen garden at Kyoto has a great beauty at the dawn, in the break of day, in the early hours of morning. It has a wonderful beauty when life seems to burst forth. This is the youth of man. For in those hours the morning glories open along the fence. The birds awaken. And the fish capture on their shiny bodies the first rays of the dawning sun. Then comes the strong, quiet light of noon that seems to cast no shadows. Here all the world is busy, and the little insects are fulfilling their destinies. And all things are growing, and the water in the pool is touched by the breeze. Then comes the long, quiet hours of evening, and the pool is again greatly changed, and the little garden is altered, and perhaps late in the night the moon casts its reflections in the pool until it seems that the moon itself has come down from the sky. These are the moods of the garden. This garden is life. Some will say I like the dawn better than the sunset, but who knows? For if there are creatures that belong to the dawn, there are creatures likewise that belong to the sunset. Some sing in the morning and some at night. Some find their strength in the brightness of the day, some in the long, quiet twilights of the evening. But this is life, one mystery lighted by the various aspects of consciousness. There is the rising sun of consciousness, the noon sun, and the long, quiet afternoon and evening. The garden does not change, but it seems to change as the shadows change. So this is life. We are living one life in three aspects. Each of these aspects is strangely fulfilling. And if Zen can reach into our consciousness, it can help us to see all this fulfillment. A difficult youth has not been lived in vain, for it has given us great insight if we allowed ourselves to grow. The responsibilities of maturity are not less desirable than the leisure of age. Each of these stages has its own beauty, its own wealth, its own meaning, its own consciousness. And finally, in the long, quiet evening, there is a grace, a gentleness, a peace, a freedom from the pressures and stresses of the day, and these quietudes are also great rewards. Everything is reward instead of penalty if our own inner consciousness sees strength. So Zen is, as far as I can re realize, if not by name, at least by what the word means, is the only answer to the non-tranquillities of our hearts and minds. Zen is the only experience that can make us greater than our needs. It is the only approach to life that takes away all the bitterness and leaves only the beauty. Now, some may say, of course, that it is a form of self-delusion, that the world is not beautiful, and that the little pool is not beautiful. It's only our own looking at it that makes it beautiful. Well, 
Who really cares? Who cares what is the cause of happiness as long as it comes? Who is really concerned about the substance of peace if he lives within its transforming power? Who really is much um, mattered by it all? What we come to do is to live, to learn, and to meet the transitions of years with as much joy and dignity as we can. And all the values of this experience we call life depends upon the light of our own consciousness making these values to shine. If consciousness does not enlighten them, all these values seem to be monotonous tragedies, disillusionments, and disasters. But lit for the light of inner concepts, they are all lessons, opportunities, privileges, realizations that have great meaning for us. So I don't think it is very important whether we can prove any of these things logically or rationally. I don't think the Zen would be much interested in trying to prove anything. All he is interested in is experiencing oneness with life. If he experiences this oneness, no proof is necessary. If he does not experience it, no proof helps him very much. It is all simply the action of his own personal consciousness. If, uh, if when we go along through the years, we face these different problems, there are all kinds of attitudes we can take. We can resent but it does no good. We can worry, but we gain nothing. We can rebel, but what are we re rebelling against? Shadows. Circumstances over which we can never achieve a true victory. We can walk out on a situation and try to leave it behind, but the situation walks out with us and remains ours until we solve it. There seems to be no answer to any of these problems, except to search for in our, within ourselves for the magic garden of the ancient temple, the garden of clear quietude, the garden in which our consciousness can find the circumstances for true thinking. If we could sit quietly by the side of the little pool of the Zen temple and be very quiet, we would at that time come very close to infallible judgment. For if in that quietude we say to ourselves, is this person good or bad? Is this circumstance important or not important? Is it valuable that I do this or valuable that I do not do that? Our conclusions in meditation would be true almost beyond our conception. For in this mood there would no longer be any selfishness, self-interest, evasion. We would not drag up old antagonisms and animosities and flout them in front of ourselves again. In absolute quietude we know what is valuable. And as the Zen points out, probably the most important discovery is that very little is valuable except the experience of reality. It makes very little difference whether we achieve wealth or remain poor. It does not mean much whether the masses revolt or the masses do not revolt. Because if they revolt, they simply fall under new masters. There is only one freedom, and that is the freedom from desire, freedom from attitude. The moment we are free from attitudes as we know them, we do not simply go to sleep and have nothing on our minds from then on. This freedom is not the beginning of inertia or mental laziness or some strange psychic torpor that is going to come over us. This quietude is simply 
an unfolding of a new dimension of experience, of consciousness. We suddenly understand things. We understand all the things we have sought to explain. Perhaps in the true spirit of Zen we understand them so well we cannot explain them. But within ourselves we know the answers. We suddenly know why we are here. We can't tell anyone else, but we know. We know where we're going and where we came from. We know the meaning under the experiences that have caused us agitation and pain. We have also some strange insight into all our mistakes. And in the end, we come, I guess, to the supreme knowledge that men can attain. Namely, that all things exist forever in wisdom and manifest forever as love. Once we know this within ourselves, most other learning is unnecessary. He does not deny the right of learning. Among the Zen people there are doctors and lawyers and scientists, just as among all other people. But Zen is an attitude toward these things. Zen does not detract from our knowledge, but it some way helps us to find greater uses for our knowledge. A Zen does not prevent the scientist from being a scientist, but it lifts him to a union between his science and his consciousness. And he is no longer an intellectualist playing with ideas that he doesn't understand. Also in Zen, strangely enough, understanding itself is ill-defined. We can't say just what it is that is understood. But whatever it is, it is suddenly extraordinarily good. Suddenly all the sorrows and burdens of the world are transformed into beautiful gardens. It's hard to say just how this happens. It can never be forced upon anyone. But I think that the first thing that Zen gives us is complete dedication to the highest. And the second thing that it gives us is perfect freedom in perfect obedience. So little by little, we get a new kind of world to live in, a world not of man and his fame, his fortunes, his conflicts and his ambitions, but a world of growing, in which man makes the direct and immediate journey from his present state to the state of security. But in some mysterious way, he moves from now with its insufficiency to an infinite sufficiency. And in the presence of this attainment, the things that we are normally interested in lose most of their value. Yet when we find the old Zen monk who has made a great achievement, perhaps the abbot of one of the old monasteries, we do not find a ponderously learned man looking with deep seriousness upon the sorrows of the world and shaking his head gravely at every misfortune. He is not that kind of learnedness which is carrying all the burden of the world on a frail back. He is most likely to be a very happy, smiling person. And in his face, which may be wrinkled with age, and as like as not, he is shaven-headed, we have something of the strange effect of a child. The wise old man has the face of a newborn babe, a face that is strangely smooth and calm, a face like the child. The child has not learned to be afraid. The wise old man has learned that there is nothing we need to fear. And so by degrees the strain and stress are gone, and extreme wisdom 
brings back a childlikeness which gives us an infinite faith in life and in reality and a very deep affection for our fellow man, a willingness to serve and to help in which no burden is too great. But above it all, through it all, and in it all, simply a wonderful, radiant happiness. The kind of happiness that can only come to the individual who has found that the dream of misery is really only a dream. And awaking from it has found God's world, the world of light and peace, and found that it was here all the time. Well, we have over three billion people in the world today, most of whom have never found this other world, this world of peace. But it is not out in some other orbit of space. It is not far away where we cannot contact it. This other world is simply the otherness of ourselves. The Zen points out that it is quite conceivable that the individual, in an instant, can become that otherness. That all the light is very, very close to us that it is no further from us than the light of the sun for the man whose eyes are closed. If he opens his eyes, he sees all. If he closes his eyes, he insists that there is no light. So Zen is not really so complicated a procedure as we might think. It is rather the attainment of the inner peace of, or quietude by which we dare to open our eyes. Instead of living in a world in which we depend forever upon the words of others coming in our ears telling us what the universe is like, instead of getting our descriptions and definitions of space from scientific formulas or from these strange records held in spaceships, Instead of all these things impinging upon us as our only form of instruction, the attitude of Zen is, be quiet and open your eyes. Open your eyes and you will see that this whole universe is one magnificent garden. Close your eyes and it's a battlefield. Open your eyes and all men are your brothers. Close them and most men hate each other. Open your eyes and life is a magnificent experience. Close it or close your eyes and life is blindness staggering to the grave. Everything depends on those inner eyes. And you know that they are opening as you perceive the universe as better. Also, as you find that your own life is richer in reality. Open your eyes, open that inner realization in yourself and find your family. Find your husband or wife, find your father or mother. Find your children. Find them as experiences of your own consciousness. Learn to understand their needs from your discovering your own needs. Close your eyes and you are strangers under one roof. Open your eyes and life is so full of wonders and so full of treasures that you do not know where to begin. Close your eyes and in your blindness struggle desperately for a few shares of stock or a little real estate. Open your eyes and find all religion one. Close them and struggle in a world of creeds. Open your eyes and find life and love and wisdom and laughter. 
close your eyes and live in the somber shadow of your own moods. Then we'll help to open these eyes if we give it the right to do so. If we cultivate to the best of our ability integrity and try each day to experience a little more beneath the surface of things into their realities. We overcome a little of our own smallness, we will discover more of universal greatness. These are the things we have to do with the years of life. And these are the things that sometime the world is ha going to have to do. If it is to escape the, the madness of its own blindness. Open our eyes, and the brotherhood of man is a fact. Close our eyes, and atomic bombs hang over our heads. It is all a matter of this mysterious dimension of consciousness. Youth is a dimension of consciousness. Maturity is a dimension. Age is a dimension. But consciousness is above all its dimensions. And life is one. Reality is above all knowledge and aspects of knowledge. It is one. Knowledge comes to us perhaps through the limited sensory perceptions that we have developed. But this insight comes to us through an added perception, the power of internal meditation. And it is this meditation that sets us free, but in our freedom binds us as never before to the eternal plan of which we are a part. Well, our time is up. We thank you very much.